I am the kid moving in jail. Hi, it's a... What, what, what's he doing here? And welcome to Kid Movie Ninja with your hosts, Fighting Leaf and Husky the Wolf. No, seriously, what's he doing here? So, today, we're going to be looking at one of Bear's favorite movies. Let me guess, all of his favorite movies involve talking bears. Well, think about it, Husky. How many times does Bear here get any actual representation in the movies that we watch? Besides, after the atrocity that was the 2010 Yogi Bear film, watching one of these that doesn't suck is going to be a nice refreshing change of pace. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let us present for your viewing pleasure, Paddington. A brief history first. This movie was based on a book series written by the late Bond, Michael Bond, originally published a buttload of a long time ago in 1958. It follows the adventures of a bear named Paddington living in London after moving from darkest Peru. That's British speak for somewhere in Peru. This series became a sensation in England, and after many sequels, toys, and TV adaptations, a live-action film was made for it in 2014. Then, without further ado, let us dive into our feature presentation. The movie begins with a movie. Good start. Vast, unexplored wilderness, shrouded in mystery. I travel light, carrying only the absolute essentials. Maps, rations, modest timepiece, and travel piano. Ding! It's funny because he's British. And again, because he's British, when he sees a brand new species of bear, his first instinct is to shoot it. It's all right, little guy, you can look. It's not that kind of movie. Pfft, what a baby. Nah, instead he becomes friends with them, and shows them all the neat stuff he brought with them, including the magical elixir of life itself, Orange Marmalade! Yeah, that's sort of a... When did he get that? I honestly have no idea. This clip does help establish a fun tone for the rest of the film, though. It has a solid comedic timing and doesn't try for any kind of pun or shock humor. It's the last line he says, though, that has the most importance for the rest of the film. Goodbye, Lucy. Goodbye, Fastuzo. And if you ever make it to London, you can be sure of a very warm welcome. Clearly, though, if any of you have ever been to London, like we have, you'll know that welcomes there are not necessarily the most welcoming. Londoners are a lot like New Yorkers in that way. And these guys are gonna learn that the hard way. And yes, we know that in the context he meant specifically from him if they ever went, but still, it's a fair indictment of modern Western culture as a whole, not just about British culture. Leaf is into the whole people suck subtext and stuff. We cut to an orange time skip because bears don't keep calendars. They also don't live in tree houses or make marmalade. We must remember to take him a jar when we go to London. London? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't worry. We've been talking about that trip for 40 years. 40 years? Then why didn't you just carve that onto the orange? Don't try to impose logic onto this movie, Husky. But yes, these two are Aunt Lucy and Uncle Pestuzo, voiced by Imelda Staten and Michael Gambon, respectively. They really have wanted to go and visit the unknown explorer who came to see them all those years ago. One thing I can really get behind, too, is that this movie is really fun! Give me back my hat. Yes, Uncle, but- No buts. It's about time I got a bit of respect around here. Embarrassing. No one takes themselves so seriously that they can't laugh at their situation, so the humor feels honest and good-spirited. Nobody hates each other, and no one's ruining anyone else's lives yet. Man, why does this feel so rare? It's probably not. It's just been a while since we've seen a live-action film with talking animals in it that actually managed to endear us to it so early. No one asked you! Playing three characters is hard. 
The plot really gets going when an earthquake tears through their home, destroying everything. Why is the bear shaking its butt at the camera? Because he's trying to hide from what's coming next. The young bear here, who is clearly going to be Paddington, voiced by Ben Wisha, manages to slip into the earthquake shelter with his aunt. Because bears totally have those! But Uncle Pastuzo does not make it. Dead! Pretty much. So they sail down the river to, uh, I guess it's supposed to be Lima, Peru? And Aunt Lucy sends the little bear off to London, since she's real old and stuff and feels like retiring now. Not quite that heartless. She gives him a note asking for someone to take care of him when he gets there which is a reference to the original Paddington storyline, and a reference to World War II child evacuees in London. Hooray for depressing origins! Anyway, what if they don't like bears in London? They will not have forgotten how to treat a stranger. <laughs> oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> So he starts his trip for London, and all he has to eat is jars of marmalade. Do bears get diabetes? Because I'm pretty sure he's asking for it now. Also, fart! <gasps> so he arrives in London, where he sneaks off the ship, sort of, and gets whisked away to Paddington Station in London. And just like we'd expect, no one cares that there's a talking bear standing in the middle of the terminal. Look at him try to be all sweet and polite and stuff! That's not how you get what you want from people! Oh, please let me out of here! I'm sorry I ordered the wrong kind of pizza! It won't happen again! <laughs> Don't look at us like that, he put olives on it. So now it's late in the evening, and no one in all of London Town has been kind enough to take in this bear. And this is where we see the start of the movie's running gag, Pigeons. He sees one approach him for food, and out of the kindness of his heart, gives him a piece of his emergency marmalade sandwich that still hasn't rotted. Ah, right, I see what I've done. Um, come on, you can't all be having emergencies. You see, kids, this is why you should never share anything ever. Here's where we meet the Hooman family in this movie. Let's name them off real quick. Worry Wart Dad, Henry Brown, played by Hugh Bonneville. 7% of childhood accidents start with jumping. Free Spirit Mama, Mary Brown, played by Sally Hawkins. And it was fine until you jumped in the lake. It's a Victorian bathing pond, darling. It's what you're supposed to do. Not naked. Angsty teen Judy Brown, played by Madeline Harris. Did you have fun, pumpkin? It's Judy. And boy child, Jonathan Brown, played by Samuel Jocelyn. But if I'm gonna be an astronaut... Well, you're not gonna be an astronaut. You can be whatever you want, Peanut. We get all that characterization from them in less than 30 seconds. Sure, they're stuck, but there's no beating around the bush here. These traits are further reinforced when we see their initial reaction to the bear cub. Stranger danger. What? Keep your eyes down, there's some sort of bear over there. Probably what? selling something. Good evening. No, thank you. It's refreshing to see a scene like this not resulting in some kind of catastrophic meltdown just yet. We really get to feel the cub's emotions while still basking sufficiently in fun visuals. The balance between a light tone and honest emotion is where so many films like this fall short. This one manages to succeed in that balance by properly pacing itself. Yeah, this ain't some big action sequence, so it doesn't have to be all over the top all the time. Soon enough, though, Crazy Mom decides, wait a minute, a talking bear is actually kinda neat! Isn't it? Also, SYMBOLISM! I miss stealing other people's jokes, it's fine! Anyway, Dad here is being snippy and sarcastic, as you'd expect from a Londoner, but Mom is still trying to get to the bottom of things. So Mom volunteers her family to try to offer him some help, and Pops is none too pleased about that. We then get our first scene of the cub not really fitting in well with human society. And we hear his name for the first time. What? Right. Oh, right. Animal name. 
Yeah, I can imagine some of you are wondering why we just call Bear Bear. Well, the reason's basically because his real name sounds a lot... <coughs> ...like that. Again, this movie isn't making him destroy everything he touches just yet, but we still get the idea that he's clearly a fish out of water. What's also neat is that everyone in the family has a different reaction to him, too. The kid likes him, the teen thinks he's embarrassing, mom feels sorry for him, and dad just doesn't want to deal with him. Or perhaps he'd like an English name. And here comes the moment of truth. An English name? Like what? Bob, oh, here it comes! Oh, look, Henry, it's perfect. You want to call him Ketchup? Darn it, Dad, you ruined the moment! It's finally official. We can now refer to him properly as Paddington instead of just Bear Cub for the rest of the review. We get a brief cameo from Bond, Michael Bond himself, before getting to the Brown household. It's all really cool looking, and Paddington's just eating it all up. But then... Oh, uh, we're not giving you a home. Oh? They make it clear that this is only a one-night thing, just long enough to find him a proper guardian. Proper is a word meaning anyone but them. Oh, well, naturally. But what if no one in town knows you? Where do you go then? Some kind of government facility. What? Like an orphanage? You have one chance to recover from this, Pops. No, 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 not an orphanage. It would be more like an institution for young souls whose parents have, sadly, passed on. You blew it! Paddington does not care for being kept in scary buildings with lightning storms, so he suggests looking for the explorer who went to visit them in darkest Peru. And now the game is afoot to figure out who and where the explorer is. First bathroom problem! No, first we introduce the housekeeper. Ah! This is Mrs. Bird, played by Julie Walters. She's going to prove awesome by movie's end. Button down the hatches, young'un. There'll be a storm tonight. Oh, radio said it was clearing up. Oh, radio. Feel it in my knees. My knees never lie. Now? Now. Bathroom problems! It starts off slow with him sticking toothbrushes in his ears. And we've all been there! It was one time, Husky. Please let it go. And then it climbs, and climbs, and climbs until... The storm is upon us. Oh, you and your knees. I can tell you for a fact, Mrs. Bird, it is not going to rain indoors. He clearly doesn't know what kind of movie he's in. Uh, I'm just having a spot of bother with the facilities. That is the most British thing I have ever heard. And so he opens the door, and we have punchline! That was amazing. I like this kid. Yeah, it's partially because of him that we are so endeared to Paddington's shenanigans. It's not like he's slowly making everyone regret bringing him into his house. Some people actually enjoy it. <laughs> Only some of them. And those people didn't like him anyway, so there's no cringe-inducing moments here. Now we get to see the first of his letters to Aunt Lucy. London is not how we imagined it. Hardly anyone says hello or wears hats. And you can no longer simply turn up at the station and get her home. Normally this is where I might groan at the movie for being on the nose with its message, but if you've noticed throughout my reviews, I often state that good movies can get away with such things. That is the case with this film. Yeah, because we like the character and enjoy the story so much, we're a lot more receptive to him and what he has to say. Movies like Birdemic Shock and Terror make a joke out of their message, not because man's impact on nature isn't important, but because the film is inept in every way. Damn global warming. This movie, however, is really good, so I actually care about how sucky London is. It also helps that this bit is short. Yep. Actually, uh, a lot shorter than the time we've spent talking about it. Yep. Yeah. 
Anyway, the next actual plot point happens when Paddington reveals that the hat he's currently wearing belonged to the explorer who went to Peru. This is so far the only evidence of such an expedition. Mrs. Mom Lady here knows an expert in old stuff and is going to take him there to see him. And not take him to the authorities like she promised Grumpy Dad. Before we get to that though, it's time to introduce our villain. Wait, this movie has one? Well, it's a kid's film over 20 minutes long, so it's pretty much obligated to have one. This is not young Cruella de Vil, Millicent, played by Nicole Kidman. She likes surrounding herself with things that I could arguably put over my left hand. Don't even joke. Except her twist is that she likes their butts, too. Anyway, she's about to stuff this squirrel monkey over here when her henchman tells her about some animal leaving behind a bunch of marmalade jars on a lifeboat. Yeah, now she's on to Paddington and wants his butt. Please stop before we get demonetized again. Anyway, the next morning, the family takes Paddington to the subway station. Now, watch out. There are thieves, murderers, and pickpockets on every platform. So follow us and do exactly as you're told. Aw, oh, he forgot flashers and drug dealers, too. Learn to be inclusive, Pops! As you've probably guessed, he's not having an easy time navigating the subway station. I dreaded this part because scenes like these tend to make me cringe hard, but this one did not. Probably because it's also short and doesn't result in setting everything on fire by the end. The big thing this movie does right is hold itself back. Self-control is the name of the game so far. Not everything has to result in catastrophic property damage in order to be funny. Nobody needs to suffer horribly all the time for it either. Leaf, are we forgetting something? I don't like it in here! Nah, I can't think of anything. There's so much to gush over in all these scenes, but we're gonna skip ahead to the part in the antique shop when Paddington observes an attempted pickpocketing, only to have a hilarious misunderstanding. And we're not being completely sarcastic this time around, because this scene is still very, very dumb. But it's cushioned in a movie that is still fun and endearing, which makes the dumb fun. That's why restraint and self-control are so important because once you get to the part where you pull out all the stops, that is when they become amazing. Here's what makes the chase for me. At one point, Paddington flies by the teen girl's classroom, because shut up! And normally this is where he'd completely humiliate her and make her hate him even more, yada yada. But that ain't what happens here. Instead, he tackles the pickpocket, becomes an unintentional hero, and is pretty much the coolest thing these dumb kids have ever seen, teaching her that not everything has to be embarrassing. Again, refreshing. During that chase scene, the antique shop owner had a chance to look over Paddington's hat and found a symbol connecting it to something called the Geographer's Guild. A very old explorer's club. So the next thing they do is go to see them in the morning. Which means... Not taking him to the authorities. Which also means... Dad's gonna be mad. So they get home and Teen Girl brings over a newspaper. Printed at the speed of social media, apparently. We see that Paddington is famous now, and we get a little bit of backstory on Dad. Apparently he used to be fun, but then he had a kid, and he became... less fun. Didn't Cabbage used to have a motorcycle? No, Husky, we are not springing for a motorcycle for a stupid cutaway gag. But... but I really did have a motorcycle! It was cool! No one cares! Anyway, it's time for a shower scene. What? Ah, oh, the bear. Got it. So yeah, the kids are trying to clean up Paddington so he can make a better impression on their dad. This is where he finally gets to don his famous blue coat, and Paddington achieves his final form! So powerful is this new form, in fact, that even Grump Dad can't resist it, and promises to take Paddington to the Geographer's Guild instead of to the authorities. Wooden buttons must be like kryptonite to Englishmen. And speaking of things that kill heroes, we got a visit to a crazy lady! Here's Millicent after she tracked down the cab driver who took Paddington to the Brown household. And here she is when he won't tell her where he took him! Pfft, barbaric. I have to use the facilities! Now let me-
let me introduce you to Mr. Curry, the neighborhood busybody, played by Peter Capaldi. He's presented as a secondary antagonist to the story. And what happens when a lonely old man lays eyes on an attractive young villainess? Oh, oh, I know! Yes, Husky? He falls in love! So they join forces and- NEXT SCENE! So Dad and Paddington head to the Geographer's Guild, which looks like it's made out of spaghetti, and ask about expeditions to darkest Peru. And they don't seem to have updated their bookkeeping technology since the steampunk era. We've never been to Peru. What? But you must have done. I can see you're very busy. Perhaps we could just go and check? There are over two million letters, diaries, and artifacts up in our archive, meticulously filed. And they don't stay that way by letting strange men and their bears rummage around. Oh, she done it now! Miss, you have just invited a plague of comical karma to rain down upon you and this entire facility. And it's all your fault. So the next thing that happens is... extremely uncomfortable. It's called a hard stare. My aunt taught me to do them when people had forgotten their manners. Oh, give me a Good crap, that bear's better at it than you are! Everything! So, what does this new, more powerful Paddington compel Mr. Brown Dad to do? Why put together a Mrs. Doubtfire cosplay? What else? This is never going to work. Of course it will. You look very pretty. That's what they'll say in jail. So, anyway, he goes in and crosses paths with. I'm seen you before, have I? No, that's right. I'm new. Mm. You have weird taste in movies. So after that very uncomfortable exchange, they reach a Bronze Age computer to find that there have been at least 200 items for Peru, but most of them had been destroyed. But before the plot can thicken anymore, Creepy Guy calls back Mr. Lady, forcing Paddington to play with the computer a bit. And then... That's what you get for being snippy with a protagonist. Stop that sexy woman! Oh. Dude, get some standards! We stop by the villains for a moment and... Oh, but it always starts with just one, Mr. Curry. Soon the whole street will be crawling with them. Drains clogged with fur, buns thrown at old ladies, raucous all-night picnics. Huh. According to Bear, that was really racist. I love this movie! So they take this footage reel they found to the antique guy to play it for them. And it turns out to be the footage from the old Explorer Man from the beginning of the movie! Most importantly, we learn the Explorer's name, Montgomery Clyde, played by Tim Downey. But then they go and show a montage of Paddington adjusting to life with the Browns right after making progress on finding the Explorer! That's not fair, movie! Blech, anyway, the next step in their journey is to look up every M. Clyde in London and hope one of them's this Montgomery guy. Oh, I'll come with you, Mary. I need to refresh our marmalade supplies. Uh, shouldn't someone stay with Paddington? Uh-oh. Well, it's only for a few hours. Oh, you don't need to worry, Mr. Brown. I think I've got the hang of things. Well, he's learned stuff. What's the worst that could happen? Super villain attack. <laughs> Yep, Mr. Curry informs Millicent that Paddington is alone in the house and she makes her move. So, long story short, Millicent attacks, Paddington panics, and sets the house on fire. Like you do. I'm actually a bit more interested in the aftermath of this scene than the scene itself, so we're gonna skip ahead a bit. Also, while editing, I remembered that Paddington himself didn't actually set the fire, so, uh, that was a mistake. <laughs> 
First of all, no, the fire does not destroy the entire house, leaving the Browns homeless. That would have been going way too far. Props again for the restraint. On the other hand, no one believes Paddington when he says he was attacked. What? Well, it had the head of an elephant and the body of a snake, but it tried to shoot. Have you been drinking salt water? No. Paddington, why don't you tell us what really happened? What? I mean, would you believe that? He has no concept of what a bodysuit and gas masks are. This makes dad jeans want to give him to the authorities again, but rather than really being angry with him, he's just upset that Paddington won't tell them the truth. Even though he is telling the truth, but they don't believe it, and so there's no other truth he can tell because... Ah! So yes, we're once again at that typical kid movie sad part where no one trusts the hero and he decides to run away to find the explorer on his own. Paddington was nice enough to leave a note that he was running away, and this just rocks the family even harder. Dad says it's for the best, but I don't think even he believes that, and Mrs. Bird calls him out on it. You just don't get it, do you? What? This family needed that wee bear every bit as much as he needed you. There. Said my piece. Well, you gotta admit, there's something a little different about this kid movie sad part. True, this one is born of a common misunderstanding trope, but the consequences are not about them figuring out the truth so much as learning to forgive and understanding. But even those details are pretty derivative. I guess what makes this different is just how gentle it all feels. This film is living proof that you don't need to go over the top all the time to keep an audience interested. In fact, you shouldn't. Big moments should be just that. Moments. But that can't be all there is to it. This movie is still doing a lot of what other really bad kids movies do, but I don't know, I just don't hate it in this film. And I think I understand why. Paddington goes through a whole bunch of places looking for an M. Clyde until he comes across one last place. You explorer Montgomery Clyde. That's right. Come on in out of the cold, I'll be right down. Oh. Oh, thank you. You know that moment when something seems too good to be true? And I suppose I hoped he might give me a home. But I can do that. Yep, way too good. Plot twist, Millicent is the daughter of Montgomery Clyde, the explorer. After she spurns the affections of Mr. Curry, she takes Paddington to get stuffed, while Mr. Curry does what he does best and rats out Millicent to the Brown family. As it turns out, every great explorer was supposed to bring back an animal specimen to the museum, but Montgomery Clyde refused since, you know, these bears were basically people. But because the other scientists were British and think anyone who doesn't play cricket is beneath them, they pull a Hulk Hogan on him and erase every mention of him from their records. Oh, and young Millicent here is played by Lottie Steer, the kid whose face is all over the Les Mis posters. Basically, stuffing Paddington is her way of getting revenge for her family's humiliation. We good? We're good. Wrap up? Wrap up. What the? I think he wants to do the wrap-up. She tells Paddington she's going to stuff him. He naturally tries to run, but gets darted in the butt, but stands back up and beats up the crazy lady. Okay, that's it. Your wrap-up privileges are revoked. He gets darted. The Browns pull a Mission Impossible operation, complete with sewer infiltration, booze, and a freaking bomb! They cut the power, interrupting Millicent's operation. These two kiss for what's probably the first time since their son was born. He is absolutely not a ninja. Pigeons happen. He gets there in time to wake up Paddington, but not actually be helpful. A short chase. He climbs through the chimney, and come on! I was kidding about the Mission Impossible thing! Anyway, the chimney's about to fry him, the Browns save him, Millicent is about to shoot everyone, but by the power of sandwich, birds happen, then Mrs. Bird happens, she falls off the roof, the day is saved, and Paddington and the Browns live happily ever after until the sequel. The end! Now, there are two points I've been teasing at up until this point, and now I'm going to cover them both. Nicole Kidman isn't a bad villain or anything, she just wasn't really needed for most of the film. I was plenty engaged with Paddington's antics and the mystery about the identity of the Explorer. She wasn't poorly handled or anything, and she really did serve a purpose, but she was more of a plot device than a character. The second part is what made the movie work, even though it did a lot of stuff bad kids movies do. Well, I alluded to this earlier, but I really do think this is a matter of the film's protagonist being extremely likable. 
Sure, he makes mistakes, but ultimately he's polite, considerate of others, generous, and all around someone who you would want to root for. Characters like Yogi Bear, E.B. from Hop, Woody Woodpecker, and Peter Rabbit don't have that kind of likability and make the mistake of trying to pass off their unlikable traits as somehow being endearing, which just doesn't work. When you like the characters, however, as in Paddington's case, it doesn't really matter what happens around them, you just want to spend time with them. And there you have it, the first good live-action talking animal movie we've covered on this show. Can we lose the bear now? Everything's starting to smell like oranges! Yeah, we should do that. And besides, somebody has a prisoner to attend to. Hello? Is anyone still there? I no longer need the facilities! I am the kid movie ninja. This Patreon shout goes to Megan Cloud, Joy Jenkins, and introducing Bashful Ivory. Thanks a lot for your guys' continued support. Also, be sure to check out Steve Sharp's music at his YouTube channel in the description below. If you want to be awesome too, go to my Patreon account and support my work. Also, if you want to send me anything by mail, send it to P.O. Box 82, Prospect, Kentucky, 40059. Take care, guys. Later.